Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapters 82 to 83. I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 82. Jack and Dalta go down a tunnel. Her brave adventurers were not exactly in uh, perfect shape to take on the undead horde, having just faced off against an army of spiders. Dalta's frogs needed some time to catch their breath. Not that Dalta would admit that being at anything less than 100%. Jack, who was something called a kabold, according to Nu, stayed resting near her core. The first proper rest he had gotten in 20 or 40 years. Dalta wanted to pretend that she was expecting a trap or distrust the kobold, but she didn't. Jack sounded quite insane and very lonely. He rambled on about undead, bombs, eating bones and licking walls, but he refused to stop talking. He almost seemed a little needy for any ounce of conversation. How long had he been underground? Delta let him sleep as Rennie stood guard. The mime was still wary of the lizard, but after a couple quick words, the mime just gave Jack an odd look. Another victim of the silence, a brother in the arms in some way. So, with nothing else to do, and definitely not dwelling on her dream, Delta did what she did best. Make things better by making them worse. The empty room behind the circus had been her focus until the spiders attacked. Now, the only evidence that was even growing egg in her tunnel. Well, at least that was what Delta hoped for. If anything survived above, then that would just be annoying. Imagine if the town had seen her make a little mess and got angry or something. She might die from embarrassment. She pushed that thought aside and focused on the lone room that now curved to meet the new spider tunnel. The room here was still some spider queen's purple tinge, but it was aimless and docile. Delta tapped her chin as she sat on the empty air to think. If this was all the shortcut by combat, then this room had to be defense from the strong but not the smart. That only made sense. Some sort of puzzle room should the spider theme be something? Delta had mana and DP to spare, really. Nu hadn't lied about the third floor and the egg draining the excess. Her mana was now maxed at 200 and her DP was near the 800s. It was insane that so much was open to Delta. She shook at the idea for a moment, getting lost in what she could do compared to what she wanted, which was asking for trouble. Her eyes opened to the room to make a giant gate and solid iron bars, spending a little more mana to add thick vines interwoven through the fence like the gate to add some more weight to the whole thing. She focused on a growth of metal and mana bubbled at the center of the gate, forming a spider with eight limbs made of metal, the top of which faced within reached the average person. Delta grinned as she manipulated the next part with careful intent. The limb of the spider pointed out which spinning password lock. Eight passwords needed to bypass the lock and Delta spent two mana a piece to set the crosswords. Swa, Num, Billy, Fran, Hob, Gob, Maestro, Bacon. Each limb needed one of these names. Some limbs shrunk as their passwords were shorter and some grew as their passwords were bigger. If people want quick access to the second floor, then they damn well better know who they were skipping and not giving proper respect to. Delta focused and pulled up a menu of her efforts. Web of Friends Gate. Those who know friends speak their names or else. Doubles the gate's resistance to physical attacks 10 DP. Make dummy passwords such as power or dungeon to cause various effects to happen. Effects drawn from current dungeon items, honey, feather, goblin spit, 20 DP. Let the gate give clues with guardian approval, 3 DP. Allow second floor monster names to be slipped in if invaders have knowledge of the passwords, 40 DP. Allow gate to be opened by the guardian if alive and befriended by the invaders, 1 DP. 
allow the metal spider to come alive if too many failed password attempts are given and gives it the ability to zap invaders unconscious. Also allows the rebirth of the Guardian. 35 DP Delta pursed her lips. She pretended to cough as she dragged her finger down the list as if by accident. The menu went blank and the gate became dark, iron gate covered in ivy as a spider with an actual ruby eyes glared down at approaches. It looked so lifelike. Delta had to remind herself that it could be. She floated down the tunnel and watched as Swa poked the giant egg. Make you into a giant omelette. I missed the fight and you go and die before I can show off. He growled. The fire-loving goblin poked his staff harder and the egg pulsed as one side seemed to bulge as the queen inside moved. Stop that. This is a new being. She can't be held accountable for her previous life or how much of a horrid mother she was, Delta chided. Swan, to his credit, didn't jump at her voice. I guess, but she is just going to sleep there all day, he demanded as if offended by the laziness of the egg. Delta was about to comment when the egg wobbled as it drained at just a tad more manner and glowed orange. The egg shook from side to side for a long moment. All that excess manner the egg had taken in had really sped things up. Swan looked heavenwards as the egg split in half and a flood of both yolk and goo covered his form. Delta covered her mouth in horror but Swan stood frozen as the spot as a tiny form fell to the ground. The spider had a human torso and eight spindly legs that took a long moment to gain its balance. Delta peered closely with interest. Queenie, she called. The form turned slowly and bright orange eyes blinked at Delta. Then Swan, the spider's legs scuttled forward. Papa, Swan! The young boy beamed. Swan looked at the spider boy, but just pulled his heart out of his painful manner. Spider, goo slimy, he croaked. Spider boy blinked. Not goo, I'm Queenie, the boy declared proudly. Delta watched as the young thing turned to her form shyly. Your mama, no burning, Grandma Delta. The boy beamed. Delta felt like a damn creature had just shot her in the kneecaps. G -g Grandma, Delta blustered. Swa choked. Papa, Swa screamed on the inside. Queenie, the boy spider, merely hummed as he examined the new land. All hail, the Queen Queenie, the boy Arachne. Delta had no idea how to explain it, but Swa tried to free himself while cursing the young child, giggling, and echoed his rude words. Delta knew that she would break whoever hurt her sweet spider child. She needed Muffet over here ASAP. Her group was ready for war, but Delta was too busy watching as Muffet slowly taught Kui, the shortened name for Queenie, how to form webs and how to use its eight legs. Queen constantly turned his head to make sure that Papa Swa was watching. Not that Swa had any choice. Being webbed to the wall and all, he had tried to escape, but Queen cried in Delta Frosty Gear, gave sent the goblin sulking back. Muffet turned out to be a good aunt and an excellent teacher, and all things spined her. Before long, Queen had learned to make a web, dance, drink tea, and even look slightly noble. Some of those were definitely related to spiders, another thing that could manipulate the darkness, as they found out after some testing. His powers was the strongest when the sun was set. Sis confirmed this. Entrance Guardian, Queenie Spider Queen. Middle spider who guards the tunnel to the second floor. His outlook and love for Swa gives him growth, much room to use fire and shadows in equal measure. Having been taught by Muffet the Geist Spider, he can also use slight spirit magic. If he trains himself, he can use darkness to hide himself to a great extent. More abilities may appear as he grows. Watching the young boy giggle as he scuttled away from Muffet as he tried to teach him a complex triple web knot, Delta smiled. This queen was already ten times better than the raging friggin' ice queen from before. Even if he was a different sex and age. Well... Delta's templates had been on the fritz since certain of the frogs. No real shock there. Kui, I need to take Swa on a mission. He'll be back soon, she said, and the Kui scuttled to Swa as he freed himself easily from the web. No, Papa, take none, or oh, nasty Billy. I want Papa. He buried his face into Swa's shoulder. The goblin sighed in deep suffering. Boy, listen to me. I am Swa, the great master of fire and power, not... He tried to speak, but Squee held on tightly. Papa, don't go! 
The spider boy begged. Swan faltered. Master of space and fire? He tried feebly. The black-haired child with skin as deep chocolate snuffled. I'm going to bring you back a surprise and a treasure. Swan suddenly announced, and Kui looked up with surprise before his face split into a beaming smile. Really? The child asked in awe. Swan shot Delta a panicked look as she merely gave him a cold look in return. Yes, I just need to go get it, but you can't have it if you don't behave and release me. Swan roared, but the boy looked pleased, ramming into Swan and giving him one last hug. I'll be the best boy. I can't wait for my surprise. Queen told Mufford, who gave Swa a terrible look of disappointment. They departed, and Swa looked down at the ground. Is there treasure down there? he finally asked. Delta didn't point out that she couldn't make treasure or toys and let the goblin suffer. Good chance of, uh, not really. It was a stuffy fort with dead people, she mused aloud. This was revenge for Kemi and Kui, after all. Delta paused and grinned. She had to make those two meet. Swa grumbled. He looked back at the spinning tunnel of orange and purple, which already had some flimsy webs forming. The goblin sighed in disgust. What a pest. Making me a liar if I don't do this stupid adventure. He complained and Delta briefly nudged him with a new solidity before her arm broke apart into mist. Look at it this way. There are dead things that you get to set on fire she reminded him. That did cheer the goblin pyromancer up dramatically, for some unknown reason. Daza rolled her eyes as the goblin shot off to gather Num and Billy to join the first raid party. Daza mentally rolled the team formation over in her head. Rayo was a paladin, a mighty warrior of faith. Faith, that if it can go up in a river, it can be rescued. Divina, as the cleric, her spirit's abilities were mostly still untested, but she spilled the role nicely. Luna wanted to rest beside the hot springs and reflect on what she had learned in the last battle. Rather wise of her, but the bump on her head and Gramps suggested that the idea was not entirely her own. Billy, the archer, filled the sneaky rogue slot uh, just fine. Swan was their mage, over-specialized in the burn, burn, burn school of things. Num being the monk warrior, rounded things out. The goblin had a good cracking skulls at this point, but better place to start than actual walking skeletons. Not that Delta was going to sit around and do nothing. She was going to use the weird ability that she had used way back when Divina entered Remy's circus for the first time. To see through their eyes in this halfway point, the real and dungeon space. Honestly, as creepy as the place felt, that real castle on her own remodel was sort of exciting. She could have fake passages behind paintings, suits of armor for goblins and frogs, tapestries of Bob. Oh, and what kind of boss would she have? A king, some royal knight, or a demonic jester? Hmm, seemed too close to Remy, Delta smiled as she hummed, her voice carrying as Maestro softly spread her tune across all of the dungeon. Despite her creepy dream, which she had a feeling was more like a spooky psychological attempt to freak her out, Delta didn't find so nervous now that she had rallied her forces. Jack was, Jack was the odd man out, and if he insisted on being her guide for the third floor, she was going to have to talk with him first. She found the lizard at Ferris Bar. The lizard was sobbing as he drank and ate various dishes Ferris brought out. This here is going to be on your tab, you mad thing. Ferrer reminded. Jack nodded, cheeks stuffed with pork and mushrooms. He made an almost comical gob, as Delta could almost see the food settle in his stomach. You are short and frumpy, green goddess, Jack said, showing his fangs as he smiled. Ferrer slowly reached under her bar with a blank expression. Ferrer, don't shoot the guest. Not until I've talked with him. Delta said, and Fira looked guilty as if being caught with her hand on the murderous cookie jar. Of course not, Ma. Wouldn't dirty the floors. I just cleaned them. She sniffed as the court of royal spiders, minus Mufford, all cheered and sipped Fira's three-day-old mushroom spring water wine. They all toasted to the birth of Kui. One chittered about the middle names. If twenty-four was too little, maybe they didn't want to be the old-fashioned. The last ruling king danced in circles, clearly suggesting tradition was good and not to skip on the average 64 middle names. 
the queen that had banned weaving competitions raised three legs. She wanted her name to be on the first twenty. The others all began to chide her for being greedy, as they got drunk in simple-sized cups. Jack looked ready to join them, but Farrah shot him a look. Don't bother my best customers. She warned before vanishing to check on the others and the food of the mysterious behind the bar. Delta slid onto the stool, feeling the hard wooden seat for a precious few moments before she had to resort to floating just above it. Mr. Jack, she began and the lizard looked around in panic. It was just a phase, I just wanted to be a gentleman bomber for a while. He defended the title as if Delta had unearthed some hidden secret. Delta closed her mouth, thought about asking, and then tried again. Jack, what made you keep going down there? She asked, and the kobold made a long, thinking face. Well, that was my promise, ain't it? I promised that young, soft, hot piece of, uh, I mean huntress, a lovely woman, that I would delay the silence for as long as I could. My record is still going at 34, 52, I think it was 41 years. I ran out of day scratches on my hiding spots after a while, he admitted. Huntress made Delta think of Rudy, but soft was not the word Delta would apply to the woman. Maybe it had something to do with having no scales, but Rudy was still too young. Did she have an older sister or a mother in the business? Delta had no idea. She resolved to ask the next time the woman dropped by. She still couldn't wait to show her the bar. But you ended up trapped underground, Delta continued, feeling that that was a lot for promise. The cobalt shrugged. Wasn't part of the plan, but neither was surviving. Jackie Boy here is good at messing up plans. He laughed in a deep, booming noise that had the fringes of despair and madness echoing in its ranks. I'm sorry you had to go through that, Delta said quietly. The cobalt blinked at her shape. The guests and outsiders, she was still shimmering haze of orange. Her voice seemed to be clear if Delta really focused on talking to Jack. Wasn't your fault, was it? Nah, you're my hero. You rescued me. He snapped the ball in the light, as if touching something other than the stone and bone was a joy. Delta leaned one hand in amusement. I'm more like a happy accident, kind of my entire gimmick here, to be honest. I do something and something unexpected happens. She waved her other hand in airy amusement. Jack nodded as if he got the feeling to a personal level. I throw bombs at things, they explode. It's near the damnedest thing. He looked skyward as if he had puzzled him for a long time. He shot her a sideways grin, and very old playing cards slid out of his sleeve, and he began to dance between his fingers. That could have been Jack's only form of entertainment besides killing the unkillable for decades. I want to ask a favor, if that's all right, hero. He said and Delta blinked at the nickname but merely nodded. I want to clear that level. I... I need to clear that castle. I've been stuck in the same six or so rooms and massive main corridors for years. I had to destroy the main gate to keep, well, to keep some real nasty sh stuff trapped inside. Pardon my goblin, but knowing for the first time in years, the idea I can finally beat the damn place is filling my head up faster than a stumpy, grumpy, wonderful ferris cooking is filling my stomach. The lizard grinned like a loon. He barely seemed to react as the pot was flung from the kitchen with a huff. It clunked against his head and he looked at it before lowering the pot over his head and testing it. New equipment, better than a skeleton bone helms, and untouchable ghost panties. He mumbled. Nalta blinked, but the kobold rolled his head, pot sliding as he looked for her again. I'll lend you my power. If you let me do that, I'll let you kick that castle's arse. So hard I'll make the silence yelp. How about it? I got bombs, questionable cooking methods, and sometimes I break down crying and gibbering. And I also really like mushrooms. They're nice. The cobalt tried to look earnest at the last attempt at flattery. I didn't like them either, but they grow on you against your will. I still have daydreams about a mushroom-free level, but for once, I really hope they make their way downstairs. Nothing cleans death faster than good old insects and fungi. She nodded and then held out her hand. I got a contract space open since I got a third floor. I was going to kidnap, convince the sweet priestess girl to join, but you sound like you might fit in better already. Delta mused. Jack just listened and waited, eyeing the outstretched hand. I can't break contracts yet, and I don't know the whole gig behind them, 
And honestly, every contract besides Weddle's got some upgrade or a massive change. Waddles just kind of, well, let's not mention Waddles. Dalton mumbled, and she watched as Jack slowly took her hand. I don't want to be a mindless slave. If I want to go for a drink in that little shack the others set up outside, I'll go, and if people try to eat me, I want to eat them back. Or at least take a few fingers. Jack warned. Dalton shook her head. Sorry, I don't do slaves. You'll be lucky if within a week someone crazier doesn't appear to join up. I have enough to manage without the guilt of that on my mind. Just be yourself. Don't blow people up that come without a good reason. And just remember, you're free to form the castle. She leaned down and met the creature's yellow slitted eyes. Hopping from one jail to another, Jack replied. Dalton jerked her thumb in the general direction of the dungeon. Doors that way, if you get bored and don't like it. Just walk and walk until you feel free, she promised. Use one of them down-to-earth girls who screams a lot, aren't you? Jack grinned. Now that was offensive. Dalta barely screamed anymore. In rage, didn't count. Jack downed his drink and then shook her hand. Fire that contract up, hero. I got some undead to make just dead, he said with a wide grin. Mad Jack the Cabald Dalta was sure the quiz was going to have comments on this, but what he didn't know wouldn't hurt. Besides, knowing her luck, Sis would offer her a random monster or a contract and Dalta knew that would uh, be hard to resist. Better the devil cabalt that she knew in the end. The menu appeared in front of them both. Dungeon Core Dalta, best core in the system, offers you a job, do you accept? At Jack's amused stare, Dalta looked down, cheeks going flushed. Sis is a bit too nice, she said finally. Seems to be a theme around here. Super nice, but would kind of kill you in a second. I love it. Jack cackled and accepted the contract. He was surrounded by threads of glowing orange as Sis took her first steps in to include him under Delta's banner. Jack, unknown the mad cabald alchemist, he who drank to forget, now kills to remember. Oh boy, I haven't felt that deeply invaded since I'm a grog fest in Arkansas. Jack said in a higher voice and he shook off the threads of power. His ragged kilt made of reddish leather was repaired to fell to his knees. His odd tunic and cloak looked freshly cleaned, and he had embroidered a little symbol of Dalta in various places. The cloak itself was pinned in a tunic by a golden Dalta brooch. Lots of things clinked and rattled around the cloak. Jack gave himself a one over. His claws trailed softly down the tunic and cloak. Ooh, new threads. I haven't felt material before. I shall call it Deltium. He pointed as if discovering a name important element. Dalta beamed as if she felt the cabal appear in her dungeon senses, a new cog on the fringes of it all. She was pleased to have contracted a mad bomber. Her smile faltered. Was uh, that a good thing to be pleased about? Dalta had to sit there for a long moment just to mourn how her sense of normal had died, unheard and unseen by Dalta herself. She eyed the ale with longing. That only grew when Swar stormed in, spotted the glowing orbs of Jack's chest and began to smile slowly. The cabal turned and also froze. Is that scent of burned everything? Jack asked in delight. Is that contained fire? Swar repeated in the same tone. They moved closer and Dalta wondered if it was what folks back home felt when they saw atoms smashing together in a fusion reaction. Meltdowns and disasters everywhere. She stood and decided to point the new brothers of the school of No Boom is Too Big at the undead before she had to explain a crater to Durance. She stood before the third floor stairs after a few seconds. What's the plan? News Ever Watchful Box asked. Why new? It's the most common theme of all adventuring, Dalton announced. She turned to let her voice be felt through the entire dungeon. You have to gather your party and venture forth. She said in a word touched some monster deeper, in they answered the call with joy in their hearts. Dalta looked down the dark stairs. You know things are messed up when a dungeon has to clear another dungeon to get anywhere. She mused aloud. Is that where you think things got messed up? How nice. Dalta ignored the jab and remembered the children with no eyes. Watch out, you creepy corn child ripoffs. Mama Dalta's coming when I hand you an ass kicking, she called. The stairs seemed to pause for a moment and then the spooky atmosphere. 
Then they grew dense and heavy as a challenge. Nu, no, get me my buff life god frog, my pyromantic, my monk, my goth ranger, my voodoo frog, and the mad bomber I found in my basement, she said seriously. Nu no, didn't bother responding. Wise box. End of chapter. There is no epic loot gem, only puns. Chapter 82.5. Interlude. The imp of no importance. The manner of one Lord Venutant, devourer of sheep and barn animals alike, was not one which would be called grand or even fancy. The black iron fence was covered in rust, and the garden overrun by jawbreaker vines and stranglethorn bushes was an eyesore. Honestly, the master of the home barely seemed to notice or care that his first appearance of the manor matched him to a T, down to the last button undone on his bulging shirt, in fact. Meanwhile, Impey, who's every day almost poisoned by his lord for giving him that name, woke up in his room. He crawled out from the space between the massive cauldron used to cook the ten meals that the lord ate every day and the bleeding stone walls that had been fashioned about a thousand years ago, until the demon saw how much they would have to mop up due to the seepage. Idiots, all of them. He poured a bucket of collected blood, today's flavor was goat blood, into the cauldron to sweeten the breakfast. Wasting any resource was just, well, wasteful. He smoothed down the servant's uniform and adjusted his slick hair back into some sort of order. He needed to start breakfast, pour an acid bath for the master, steam his clothes and help the natural sulfur geyser, and, of course, wake the bloody fool. He used to have help, but Lord Venutant had devoured almost all of the other imps when food was slow to arrive, or when he got peckish. The idiots didn't even see the fool lumbering towards them. They deserved to be imp snacks. Imps, Impy, was just indeed an imp. Impressive and clever his master was for giving him that name. Why, yes, it must have taken him such an effort for his tiny brain indeed. He looked around the kitchen as he tried to figure out the best plan of attack. The kitchen had been designed for a demon of his master's size, not Impey's. The old feeling of being inadequate rose inside his chest. If only Impey were taller, faster, stronger, powerful. The imp was not Impey and had long since come to terms with it, and the fact that he was short in a godly intervention. He was an imp for life. Godly, being a joke of course, Impey would bite any divine hand that tried to touch him. Ugh. Such beings would smell clean and wash under their nails. He scampered onto the stools and reached for various jars. Unicorn bladder? Mm, no, had that yesterday. He'll throw a fit, Impy mumbled, and he put the jar back and looked to the next one. Dry at toes. Could work with it, but I'll need... Impy's black eyes scanned the rows of important ingredients from the deep world. He hadn't been there himself but other demons had, and that summoned to it, and gossiped to his master, while Impey was treated like the garden gargoyle, an object more than a being. It was filled with humans, orcs, halflings, and an assortment of other things. His master, being the clever thing he was, heard that food, food, and food. So he spent a fortune on getting those old foods. They plucked another jar. Pa Prika? He tried to announce aloud, what a bizarre creature name. It must have been its bones ground to dust. He sniffed the jaw and his nose gave hints of a distant land with heat and excitement. Blech, Impy declared simply. Adventure, distant lands, foolish. The path to power was in the dangerous games of bowing one's head and ducking before some bored lord removed it. Moving from demon lord to demon lord, as Impy's skills increased, was the only path out of the imp swamps and into the sphere of any power that he could grasp. Money handling cooking, washing blood out of sheets, angling beheaded foes on spikes, chasing charity demons off the doorstep, keeping his master from biting off more than he could chew, and most importantly, groveling. His power as an imp servant was growing at an alarming rate. The new dish simply called Papa de Corn was bubbling nicely within the goat's blood. Even Impy felt his stomach rumble. Leaving the meat to simmer, he entered the main hall of the manor, where he nudged a slightly off-angled spike on the wall back into place. He checked the traps for any pests. Nothing yet. The abyss mice really did eat everything. The last week, a perfectly good spiked mace had been ruined by just damn rodents. 
and be assured that it was a weapon once touched by a demon king. Such an aghast being that Impy's knees shivered at the idea of even thinking about him. The demon, that was the very abyss itself. He had only tasted defeat a handful of times. Rumor had it that the imps could even boss around other demon lords with cruel ease. No one would dare even by proxy insult the demon king. Impy tried to remember the last name that he'd heard anything coming from the Black Heart, the very bottom of the abyss. It must have been ten years ago when the king's half-breed daughter had visited. That girl, Impy shivered at the sheer chaos that she caused in the attempts to defy her father. Three levels of the abyss were still on fire. He shook his head, floppy ears flapping as he sighed. He drew the greenish bath and made sure that it was hot as sin. Just the way that would be both pleasant and not overindulgent for his master. MP did not want to have to peel the tub of the lard out of the, well, tub again. When the slicked up iron bar, that had been one experience that he had no desire to repeat. He hurried along to the hallway, opening some windows, closing others, shifting the remains of some demon that must have snuck in to gut his master. He snapped the bones and noble giblets were going to need some heavy-duty unholy magic to remove. The doors of the master bedroom loomed, unlocked for the foolish to enter. Impy did it anyway, his form darting to the side as the grey greasy hand tried to grab him. His master grumbled in his sleep, frowning as he failed to catch Impy to eat in his sleep. Impy stared with displeasure at the round grey stomach that had a tiny head attached to it. The little head looked comically childish and smooth. The frowning little mouth was thick with ruby lips and looked unable to open wide enough for blood grapes, let alone for an imp. He moved slightly, an exposed stomach ripped into two to reveal a pair of serrated black teeth and thick cords of slime that drooled the inhalation of the impy's presence. A long tongue of black muscle lashed out and impy quickly flung a chair at the tentacle, snapping as its leg tried to drag the little body into the pit. The tongue yanked and the mouth chomped the iron wood, turning into a chewing gum before long. Impy turned to the window and slowly pulled open the thick curtain. The glass on the other side did not show the outside, but instead trapped fire elemental that was brighter than average. It was said to be close to the sun in the deep world. The light flooded in and Impy's master began to protest. No, no, I want to sleep. The petulant boyish voice complained. The stomach rippled, the deep rumble bubbling out of the gaps between his teeth. But I would kill for a snack. The stomach churned as it chewed the iron wood leaked out of its sides, stomach acid churning. The form began to sit up, and the impy was already out of the room as his master began to look around for a fresh imp for breakfast. Honestly, imps didn't even taste that good. He shuffled into the many hidden passages for servants as his master's form lumbered down towards the smell of the bath. He'd both clean himself and drink the sulfur bath, and knowing in his luck, a piece of that historic masonry that depicted the great separation of the deep and the deeper. The master's father would not be pleased. Impy would simply have to be indisposed as the demon's own kin suffered the price. Or was such in life as an imp servant? He returned to the kitchen and checked on the seasoned brew of peppered corns. It was ready, and not a moment too soon, if Impy felt the manor shake as his master roared from the dining room. The snacks and the small pleasures Impy had left were not enough to distract his stomach now. Impy could handle the head, but it was a stomach that held the brains. If Impy took too long or was too shifty, the stomach would simply swallow him up, devour his mind, learn what it wanted, and spit him back out even less than an imp than he was now. That stomach's hunger knew no end. Food, wealth, knowledge, it would devour all. A sweet, peppered meal was good to buy juicy secrets was a drool worthy. MP appeared in the center room, sliding trays of prepared desserts, cold meats, sizzling demon wine and pig flanks, and, of course, peppered corn. The head looked down at the brew with curiosity. It looks gooey. I don't want it. Impy's master protested. His stomach rumbled. But we do. We want it all. More. More. It gurgled, and its tongue began to pull the food in. Plates and all. 
the head whined and cried, as the stomach simply did as it wanted. Candy for the head. The stomach finally relented, the tongue patting its own head with affection. Impy had already placed a large serving plate of varied selection of sugars so sweet that they would make an infernal skeleton suffer casualties. One of the larger fangs of the maw lifted it up, for the head to stubby hands to grab for. Yay! The head cheered. Empy hated them. Him. It was hard to forget that glutton demons often had to push their insane hunger. That continued to grow into a whole new side of themselves. Empy would pity them if it were not for the fact that glutton demons did this so that they did not become so consumed by thoughts of eating that they forgot to breathe. The window nearby was knocked on, and be turned to see a crow, about the size of a horse, waiting on the branch outside. Impy opened the latch, and the crow stared at with beady red eyes. Do hurry up, you're letting in a draught, Impy warned. Carrying crow began to choke and bulge before it vomited up a series of letters covered in protective sacs and membrane. Impy shook off the saliva and threw some gold at the bird, who snapped it up and flew off. The bird was messy, but one could be sure that letters would not be tempered with, since it would have to catch, kill, gut, and decurse the letters to get to them. And then, of course, have to fight off an entire murder of the bugger alerted by the inherent magic. Empy flicked through them as his masters cheerfully slurped down the tablecloth. Horn enlargement, charity demons hadn't taken no for an answer. Empy would burn the plea for nothing as they begged for causes that did not exist. Charity demons were not liars, they had simply run out of causes to champion at this point. Some postcard from his stomach to the head about how he enjoyed the birthday cake of fifteen layers. Lovely. Finally, an official letter and a seal of the famous Gut Clarton clan. Impey stared at it with dismay and hope. Was his master finally going to be executed for being a wart on the family tree? Would Impey be freed? Would he be hired by a better branches? Should MP dare to hope that the letter held a withering curse that would melt the tub of frumpy lard? He dutifully slid the letter as close as he dared and watched as the tongue whipped over it and froze. That tastes, father, the stomach said in fear. The head shrunk in itself like a cursed snapper retreating into its shell. What? What does daddy want? The head whined. The tongue was quick to unseal the letter and pass it up to the head for the advantage of the head having eyes to read with. Dear Finutant, find you well. That time you ate Cousin Darina. Great shifts in the world, changes to be expected. Still banned from weddings, but not honor. You must defend your honor in combat. The head finished an alarm. The stomach grumbled. Is that all? We shall simply devour off the throes. The stomach said with anticipation. The head whined louder as he threw the letter down to the stomach. Armed combat, not gut to gut. When's the last time you held a sword? The head demanded. Impy listened with interest at this. The stomach churned as it thought hard. Fifty years? I accidentally used a sword as a toothpick, remember? Broke, so we sent it to Smithy to get fixed. We've been too busy to get it. The stomach admitted. Impy hid a snort. Busy stuffing yourselves? Impy said in a voice so quiet even his own ears could barely detect it. The tongue stretched much farther than Impy had ever seen it do so, picked him up and held him as his tiny form over the maw of the stomach. Something to say, something to add. I was sure I heard a snack demanding to be torn to pieces, the stomach said. The head glared. You're rude, Impy. The grumble and complain and we let you. Now you're saying nasty things to us. We should eat you. The head scowled, the young voice cruel at his intent. Impy saw the last moments of existence being teased out as he lowered and lower. His body almost entirely inside the hot wall, his uniform beginning to dissolve. I live to serve the only master that is important. I carry my own self into the end with pride that I outwitted you this long. I will never fetch another midnight snack for you again. Impy cursed and struggled. The head suddenly spoke. Oh... That works. Stomach, spit him out. The head ordered, and there was some hesitation before the stomach did just that. Impy stared up the proud head. We'll send Impy to get our sword, and we'll go back to bed and eat our snacks. The head announced. Stomach growled in approval. Clever. This is why you are the top, came the narcissist's praise. Impy stood, feeling his jacket slide off and slide as the entire sleeve of the shoulder had been dissolved. 
he had been saved from his master due to the sin of sloth. The touch of ironry burned and proper iron should to a demon. He turned without a word, the sweating succubus, that's the name of our smithy guild, head and the cheerfully said. Impey merely turned, bowed, and left the room. He froze as the last words came from the stomach. You are not to return until you have that sword. The gaping maw commanded, and Impey's neck itched as the magical collar that shimmered out of normal vision burned with command. Impey left through the door, and his blank expression twitched once. Then he composed himself. Impey adjusted his ruined bow tie, huffed as he yanked his sleeve back into place and scowled at the gloomy, near eternal dusk of the fifty-fifth layer of the abyss had for a sky. He cursed all the masters as he stalked down the broken path, overgrown with deadly plants and retreated under his glade glare. The gate ahead opened to the snap of his fingers. He would have taken one of the steeds that should be at the stables, but they had been a festival surprise meal. Surprise for Impey, not for Master. He stormed down the long road and watched a flock of carrying crows staring. I'm not dead, nor do I have packages, he screamed. They fled, and from behind the trees came a bunch of politely smiling demons holding tins for change. Impey gave them a flat look and then smiled. It was the most innocent and benign look. The Master would love to hear about your tales. Please do knock loudly on the front door. Impey beamed, and the group moved past him with excitement. They talked about saving bushes from the moonlight radiation. Charity demons, truly the worst blight on the land. It did make him feel a bit better to hear the doorbell ring far behind him. The sound of screaming followed soon after. Impey was sure that would feed Master until he returned. After many detours and distractions, he would be back before supper and earn his Master's mercy. Well... He would shove enough food down his fat gullet that his master won't notice his back. Impey began to walk with a slight spring in his step. He had the freedom of thoughts. He had to enjoy it while he could. The master could yank his chain at any time, and that would be awkward if he didn't have a sword, but the master would be stuffed for Impey's charity for a while. Impey cackled into the dark iron trees. Impey was on the verge of crying out of anger and frustration as he looked up the master of the sweating succubus. He had spent the day drinking high off his ears, ending up in prison cell for mistaken identity. He cried imp racism and the demons kicked him out for being too noisy. What do you mean he's been missing for 40 years? Impey demanded. The tall red demon without enough arm hair to clothe an imp stared down at boredom. Renelik got called for a job and never came back. He took your slob of a master sword to fix it on the road. He's either as dead as you think you are about to be. He found some wife to settle down with, or we got bound and stuck. Sucks all the same. That demon only ever loved the forge. The forge demon scratched his chin. Impey stared, tongue going dry as his collar grew tighter around his neck. You must have some clue. You are his employer. Impey demanded. The forge demon began hammering out a gun sword. The wretched thing terrible. Where was the appreciation for oversized butcher swords? MP knew the industry standards had slipped. Well, he said he was being summoned to outfit an army full of the souls. Can't be that many armies that sold their souls. You just need to head to the deep world and find him. The team grunted. MP felt his skin crawl. Go to the deep world, he protested, and the large creature grinned, shaking his large head with amusement. First time... Ints don't go often, the forge demon asked, but he had already turned away with a wave. Listen, if it helps, I have nose for every weapon ever made in this forge and blades. Rudy made ain't no different. I got a sniff of one of his weapons a while ago. The forge master offered. Impey couldn't follow the demon. His forge was burn him to a crisp, but he gave the demon his best urgent expression. Where? Impey yelled as the hammering began to thunder and stone. The answer made the imp's heart stop. The king's kid, Rudy was her name. She swung one of his weapons and beheaded one of the king's dragons. The demon began to laugh. Impey considered opening his master's maw and leaping in while holding his nose. Rudy, the unholy terror of the abyss. In the deep world, he's only clue. Impey went back to the bar. He drank and drank and cried. Then he plotted and plotted with an impish nature. 
Rooney paused as she stopped giving the mushroom ball guardian belly rubs. She frowned as she felt something. She turned, fully expecting to see her dad, but nothing happened. Ah well, she grinned as she sniffed. There was booze nearby. The woman took off as she laughed as she saw the pub sign. The dungeon with a bar. This was better than any place yet she had ever been. No contest. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 83. The Fortress of Silence. They gathered around her core. Ain't this a sweet little get-together? We have goblins, frogs, and oh my, a kobold. Do wonders never see starter, you foxy mama? You find the most interesting of fans. Maestro breathed through several of the mushrooms scattered around the core. Jack bent down to sniff at one. What's with the peanut gallery? He asked, and the mushroom trembled. Why? I am the star maestro. Oh, put on the pay the pen, darling. I already know I'm fabulous. Maestro chortled as he sounded pleased as Jack looked puzzled. Maestro, he's a giant demonic mushroom about the size of a tree who sings, Swa said, bored. Oh, please. I am so much more than that, hot blood. I'm the voice of a generation. Maestro sniffed, and suddenly all the mushrooms began to solidly vibrate as they broke into an angelic chorus. Maestro's voice rose above them. I cannot sing any angel choir with my heavenly chorus. He promised before the mushroom tones dived deep into the demonic chanting of a Latin cult that ended with the riff of a guitar. And my licks are hotter than Eddie Devil, he laughed. Once more, Jack didn't seem so bothered now that Delta eyed him. Can you do requests? He asked with a grin. Maestro thought about it. How about you make it back alive and impress my mama enough that make me want to? I don't work for chumps. Maestro said haughtily, and the mushrooms went quiet. Maestro once sung row row down the stream for me. Rail beamed, evidently pleased that he was no chump. Let us focus. We all have a goal to aim for. Divina's voice interrupted before Jack could respond. On her shoulder, the orange dollbird, Inchi, tilted his head. Gals are good, means Dev wins to score. Make Rail a goal. The bird was silenced as Divina snapped its beak shut without looking. Her eyes staring hard at anyone who commented. I shall help you lift. If I am to be your goal, then I shall devise your exercise routine. Rail laughed with his usual boisterous self. Numb joined him, and the two muscle heads were thunked by Divina as she frostily stalked past. Billy merely shook his head as he leaned against the wall near the stairs, watching for oncoming threats. His hooded face and red eyes truly made him a loner of the group, but Dalton could feel his ears twitch, showing he was listening with great interest. Listen up, you're all going to go down and clear the first room, long enough for me to move my call down and claim the face. Delta began. She gestured to Jack, who had carefully put his mouth around one of Maestro's speakers and was buzzing as Maestro's music calmly floated out. He looked up like a nutcase, but Delta had little choice but to keep sounding confident as she spoke. He is an expert at what to expect. Skeletons mostly, but the space downstairs can change if foes inside feel threatened, so approach with caution. Delta added, Jack spat the mushroom out and wiped his face. Scullies, ghosties, and other dark spooky crap. Not gonna be easy. Their motto is numbers is strength, and they can risk fighting to the death because it doesn't stop them. Jack agreed. Do you mean strength in numbers? Divina asked politely. Jack stared at her. Hot stuff. It's all that about using one stone to kill two bridges and burning them when we get their corpses. He explained carefully. Divina's smile became fixed. In for a penny, in for a pound, she muttered. I prefer in for a fight, in for a war. Jack said darkly as he adjusted some of his new bottles. Is it war down there? Numb was a fighter asked. He tapped his hands and his muscle body, looking more toned than ever. Was. Then everyone died and then it became routine. Jack shrugged, swore, told his staff with eagerness. Remember the goodies to go to me. I need shinies. I have a rat that will cry if I don't find some and death wand or a cursed golden pantaloons. He hissed. Child payments are so costly. But fatherhood brings out the best in you, you spark lover. But he mused, speaking for the first time. Swan glowered at him and said nothing. I'll try to watch from here. Giant Luna and Gramps with Rennie will guard the stairs while you go down there, Delta said quickly. Go down, beat things up, and look cool while doing it. 
Rail summoned up his pointed, his trident towards the stairs. To howl, and worse, none shall escape mother's mushrooms, he cried and charged. Delta felt a jaw drop. Did you just Leroy J- No, never mind. Don't say that. They might think it's true. She cried as the group trooped after Jail's jubilant war cries. She never did see Jack plucking a few of the black fungi and hiding them in his cloak. Rudy stared at the sign in front of Delta's place. It was a simple thing, but the meaning confused the hell out of her. Gone adventuring, be back soon. She read it even after a fourth time and it still didn't make any sense. How did a dungeon go on a holiday? She shrugged and walked down, opening the door the usual password. The stone doors ground to a halt, and the air that rushed past Rudy made her toes cool with pleasure, and her heart beat just a little faster. The manner of the third floor of the dungeon did right at this intense. It filled Rudy's body, and its power was at her grasp as she chose to use it. The entrance room was the same as Rudy remembered, but it besided the odd door to the right. Rudy stuck her head in and whistled. Delta girl, you got two notches above, impressed. She smiled as the artwork in the memorial space. Delta's sad expression on the statue made Rudy want to bail. She never was one for mopey scenes and feeling anything besides drunk or happy. There was a lack of awareness in the dungeon that told Rudy that her focus was elsewhere, but she strolled forward with interest. It felt like she hadn't been here in so long. She was eager to see how it had changed. And this mystical bar. That was something Rudy just had to see. She paused at the spider room where the webs were pulled back for her by the rather plump and tipsy spiders. Are you guys drunk? Rudy grinned as one of the spiders literally fell off its web with a hiccup. Rudy felt the spiders were just to greet little guys and girls, but she smelled something. Something that was often here, but gone for now. It smelled of mist and freshly spun string. Muffet twirled three times and waved her middle legs. Kui followed suit, and the boy attempted at saying, I am a child of Delta, turned into, I give this offering to Delta the Supreme. Not quite the right message. She clicked her fangs and Kui looked outspashed as he tried to correct his stance. Seriously, those extra humanly parts were throwing the poor Kui off. Why did Mother have to go and do that? Give a perfectly good spider human bits. Ruined a perfectly good spider. But that was just Muffet's opinion, so she kept it to herself. What else? How's it going, you ducking duck? Ruli popped her head into the pond room, and Black Duck opened one lazy eye and gave her a long look. You really are one of Quiss's disasters. Ruli muttered and carried on to the mudroom. Waddle stretched his wings. He stepped into the water and floated there for a long moment before he dove. He sleek black form missile as he dove into the tunnel. He followed the tunnel in its complete darkness, his own feathers carefully pointing him in the right direction. Waddle swam and swam, his need for air of formality not a necessity. He followed the seemingly never-ending dark tunnel for some time until it simply began to turn up. Dungeon Manor thinned as if Waddles had crossed realms. This was where Delta's realm ended and the real world returned. Waddles swam up and the swirling whirlpool of light above. The second entrance, a place which Waddles occasionally cleared of uh, pests. He bobbed slowly to the surface. He shook the excess water off of his feathers and peered around. The lake was spread from a distant mountain. It split into many rivers, one of those nearing the town close to the dungeon. The thin line of boundaries washed manor into the area, and creatures were more abundant here than around Durance and his summer's home. The lake was in the shape of an eye. The single lone island made up the central point. Waddles had curiously flown up to check at one time. He looked for examples of the previously stated creatures, and he saw a few. For example, the glaring, drooling black wolf pacing the shore, with corpses of goblins and smaller creatures around it. It wasn't as much of a bother as the crackling blue bird far above. The feeling of manner being drawn in to fill the showy efforts to scare Waddles with the lightning bolts. The closest foe would be the giant lure lizard that had been busy breeding in a small gang it seemed. Waddles normally wouldn't bother so much with this, but he raised his ball to the sky where the setting sun showed a half-filled moon rising in its retreat. As the moon rose, the lake water began to churn. Swirling fountains of water shot into the sky, and the central island gave off a glowing pillar of yellow light. 
Waddles wasn't that impressed, but the fact is the more it did it, the more the lake drained and most of the water pillars. And the lower the water drained, Waddles guessed that the pillar didn't even breach the treetops around it, but it was growing stronger as the moon grew stronger. Odd, but it meant that the time of the full moon came about, Waddles would have to skip his 15th nap of the day to work overtime. He snorted once of his feathers ruffled. The bird dove with his feathers covered in energy. The lure lizard snarled and rushed forward. Even the wolf snapped at the lowering water level with glee. Waddles tilted his head and his body began to leak a deadly black aura. He'd feel pity for them, but honestly, Waddles didn't feel pity. He just felt annoyed and tired. The water pillars began to spin out of control, as luck would have it, and the bird being swatted into the lure lizard and the smell of dying monsters like balm to Waddles' black mood. Now, to actually move. He turned to the black wolf, about ten more wolves emerged from the shadows of the trees to follow their leader. Waddles quacked once, in amusement. He guessed he would see if they would follow it to the abyss. He swam forward, and the moon watched the slaughter below with an indifferent beauty. Waddles emerged to see Rudy washing her mud-streaked hair in his pond. What are you staring at, she snapped. I didn't know the platforms were random, she mumbled. Waddles ignored her and went back to his nest, the blood almost impossible to see on his black feathers. There had been more. At this rate, they would begin to come en masse. That shrine and the lake and Dalton's natural manor was like a buffet. It had become worse since she had reached the third floor, and along her manner came something more alien than the abyss. Something of this world, but so against all, that Waddles had never felt such a thing before. It was leaking out, and it carried words and promises. Waddles didn't know why it kept inviting monsters to die, but soon things that might cause Waddles some issues might start to appear. He considered bringing this up to Delta, but she had a lot on her plate, and hosting one of these kind was hard enough without Waddles didn't mind guarding her entrance. But he wondered if she wanted to know about this. He tried to sound out. No, that sounded stupid. It made him sound a little sappy. He had this handled, and if worse truly did come to worse, he would simply stop being a duck. Annoyed, but he owed the girl that much. If that didn't work... Well, he knew where his summoner lived. He was sure that he could bring a few of his brethren out of the man via snapping at his toes again, or reading his spell book. If one Waddle struggled, ten also would surely be the answer. Assured with that, Waddles went to sleep, and dreamed of things unable to be described by human senses. Delta found it easier to see through Divina's eyes being the person at the back of the group and having more spiritual connection than the rest of her monsters. Delta watched as they descended the last step into a room that would host her core. The fortress of silence loomed, the entrance hall, a collapsed and spacious place, with stone pillars that one had to crane their neck to follow. Stone floors with large slates stretched to give the idea that this place was carved from a normal cave. There were windows, but the scene beyond had been faked by paintings and the flowing banners. The light of the sun had been refused to be allowed to touch this place. The most unnatural thing of all was the lack of life. Not just people or monsters, but there were no webs, no mold beyond the natural patches near the fountains and on the walls. No flies, no errant weeds breaking free of the stone. It didn't even look dusty. It was as if things such as change, entropy, and repurposed life had simply been barred from the space. Divina turned as Jack patted his fading snoot marks. This place is like a painting. It just has a certain image it likes to go for. I can screw with things, but before long it just returns back to normal. I have to keep blowing the gate up to keep the rooms over and over, but the good news is that means that all the stuff I use for my bombs and the food that I ate also came back. Jack said brightly. There was nothing else bright about this place. Ahead, two large twin doors of wood crossed with dark metal looked ajar. Jack rolled his neck. You ready? he called. Divina's confusion matched Alta's when Billy suddenly aimed an arrow skyward. They're on the ceiling, he growled, and Swan wasted no time firing a flare like a streak of flame that illuminated the grand domed ceiling. Four renegade domes that held dusty chandeliers and crystal, then brass. 
in each of these rounded holes and a mess of bones and metal, like a spider's nest of a dozen young. The skeletons had meshed together before they suddenly dropped, balls of bone and metal aiming for their heads. No horsing around where people can get hurt, Rail ordered, and he stabbed his trident into one of the balls and heaved. Swar merely pointed his staff as the torrent of blistering heat and flame knocked the second one aside. Num was punching the third one so fast that the chips and bone and metal were flying off as slowly collapsed. The last one bounced towards Davina, but a red orb was slipped into it and Jack cackled as he yelled for everyone to take cover. The rolling ball of bone promptly exploded outwards. Ribs acted like a shrapnel and the skulls as the cannonballs as they smashed into the stone pillars. The cover most of Dolphin's monsters could reach was other skeletons. The floor, or in Rail's case, crouched low and grunt. The damn frog was too hardy for his own good. A few of the skeletons looked to have survived their initial ambush attempt, and the clattering and the magically held together bones walked forward at a slow, purposeful pace. They wore no clothes and had nothing on them besides short, bladed weapons. Delta wished her eyes glowed, but instead the empty skulls looked like the night. Blacker than shadows that made it worse, somehow, that the lights and souls they expected to find shining there. The skeletons all seemed to have unending urge to rattle their jaws like a rattlesnake shook its tail. Spooky shites like to freak you out, and there's real thinkers in there. Don't let the dread drops fool you. I've seen these artists play cards when I learned to sneak better. Jack growled, both his hands holding her red robes. Davina flexed her fingers. Standing here was not doing her any favors. That was what Delta could feel coming off of the witch doctor. Well, being spurned by nature, the grave calls. She howled from her hand, and a furious spirits of green nature rushed at the skeletons. They tried, slashing at them, but Davina's spirits did not fear iron like ghosts and demons did. They were of nature, and they would bend to no one. The orbs invaded the bones, and the empty pressing silence fought back. The power keeping these souls here easily fended off the spirits of Davina, but the point was that she had caused them to come to a complete stop in the fight. Rail grabbed one skull and crashed it with his raw strength, as Billy lodged a black arrow into the eye of the socket of another. The gut rot mushrooms promptly exploded with a violent pressure. Num rushed forward. Dalto covered her eyes and began to snap like twigs. The first wave that had been pushed back and the skeletons faded to a murky black mist that was sucked back through the huge double doors as if being summoned. Shut the door. More will be on their way, and Hero, up there, better do her thing or we'll be facing two-headed snake skeletons, or the horse with the spider legs, or, or, you get the idea. They get creative. Jack yelled. Rail's shoulder bashed one side, and the goblins threw themselves at the other side. The huge, monstrous doors protested at being moved so after so many years. From the dark corridor beyond, that smelled of pain and death. There came a rumbling of bone, something that squashed and the wailing of the damned. Divina focused on more orbs of nature and fired them into the darkness, her aim wild. Are you casting magical missiles at the darkness? So I yelled. Dalton wanted to chuckle at the absurdity of a fight while Divina felt she was about to shoot the goblin next, when the screeching doors had finally shut and Rail slid his trident through the two large handles as the way to bar the door. Something extremely heavy smashed against the doors after a moment. The roar shook the room. That doesn't sound like a horse, but he screamed. Delta was going to guess elephant or some kind of dinosaur at the sound. She was distracted by a box that appeared. First room has been conquered, moving core to complete mana fusion. So I don't get a choice or we can vote on this, Delta said and then blinked as she now stood in the room where her monsters had just cleared. The door shook harder and harder as something tried to bash its way in. For a fair democracy, she finished lamely. Her core pulsed bright orange and the room around began to shake as a manor soaked into the stone. The door cracked as something and really pissed off tried to claw its way in. A lion? A mutant bear skeleton? Delta had no idea but she narrowed her eyes and nearly took Rail's head off. Don't touch my family, she growled. 
and she pulled open the menu and understood why the system had given her the monster choice it had. She smashed her first and purchased button. Garvin was a cult man. He desired the end of all people, the resurrection of the silent, and an end to all that was light and free. Really, he was quite simple in his once as a skeleton that stabbed intruders. Still, this was the most fun he'd had in years. Besides chasing the cobalt for the sum outcome, day after day, it could get quite dull. As the four-armed near skeleton attacked the entrance hall door, he rocked on his heels of his, well, heels. He was just a skeleton, after all. The bear was his best attempt yet at a minion. The only had the same creature bones to fight over. He had won extra arms in the last week's skull rolling game. His beast pounded and pounded the wood, as it shattered faster than the skeleton's happiness, when they remembered they didn't celebrate birthdays anymore. Or even remember their birthdays. A hole finally formed, and he looked to one of the dumber boneheads. He nodded for it to check. Well, they didn't speak per se, they had learned to communicate with subtle pulses of silence power in them. Well, he demanded, Bonehead looked in and froze. What? What is it? He said slowly. Bonehead turned. They have a cave troll. Came the shocking response. That was... what? A giant grey hand smashed through the fresh hole, and a large thing that could easily match the armed bear and dragged the bonehead inside, bone screeching in protest, then the sound of crunching bone for soon following. A face pushed itself through the hole. What's that? More crunchies! Ma! Ma! Can I eat them? The thing yelled. Garvin felt a chill in his bones as he swore he almost heard a woman ordering him not to play with them for too long. He turned, and if he still had his favorite dress, he would have hiked it up in a panic, and the door was swung forward and the beast stormed out after him. He had to warn the rest. He burst through the hallway, jaw chattering. Troll! Troll in the castle! End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.